and, and thanks to the organisers for giving me this opportunity to talk about the, the, the DPUK um, PETAMAR Im imaging network. So um, the first point I'd like to make is that you know, imaging biomarkers are important in clinical trials. And Jeff, you've, made it, you've already done this, um, you've made this point for me. You could use uh, imaging biomarkers to stratify your participants to to improve the, ch the, the chance of success of a, of a clinical trial. You can use imaging biomarkers um, to predict response, which patients are going to, to respond to a particular um, um, therapy. Um, you can use uh, imaging for, as a response biomarker, looking at things like volumetric changes with MRI or changes in amyloid and tau with, 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 with PET imaging or cognitive changes. Um, and you can use imaging as a safety biomarker. And again, the, the amyloid-related imaging abnormalities is a very good example of that. And this has been further demonstrated. If you look at the, the recent um, uh, positive uh, clinical trial with lecanemab, imaging is extensively used throughout that trial, both with PET and, and, and MR. So this can cause challenges as well, because it's, it's, it's valuable. But yeah, imaging is a relatively... Um, time-consuming, um, challenging um, procedure to, to do in, 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 in these patients' group. We, we want to, to study at multiple time intervals through a clinical trial, and it can be, become limiting in terms of what's practical in how many um, um, imaging studies we, 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 we can do. We can do this today with PET-CT and, and MRI scanners. And one of the, the potential benefits of the new technology of simultaneous PET-MR scans where the, the technological and engineering challenges have been overcome where you take an MR scanner and you basically put within an MR scanner PET detectors that can work within a very strong magnetic field. That can enable you to simultaneously acquire, acquire data from two different imaging modalities, PET and MR, reducing the burden to the participants with, with, within these uh, 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 clinical trials. And in the UK, we're very fortunate to have, as part of the DPUK, a network of eight of these PET-MR scanners spread across the UK from, from Edinburgh in the north to, to three other scanners in, in London. But there's a question of, can we use these scanners with, with, with confidence? And if we, if we can, how can we best use them for, for, um, with, for use within clinical trials? And there's, there's good reason to be sceptical as to whether they're going to be as good as PET-CT scans. And the reason for that is around the, the challenges around the, the, you know, the, the physics of photon attenuation correction that's needed to get quantitative images, which is a large correction for, 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 for PET images. For CT scanners, you use the CT for that, and it works very well because it's the same physical process that you're, you're measuring. But for PET-MR scanners, you're using the MR images to estimate this, the, the, the distribution of attenuating matter that's needed to get um, accurate quantitative uh, images. And various methods have been developed to do that, um, from simple methods to, to very complex uh, uh, methods. And they, they work pretty well in the head. But even then, so this, what you're seeing on the right here is a, is a graph from, from, from a, a, a publication where even the methods that work, occasionally they don't work quite so well. You get a participant where you can get some, um, some, some error. But it's not just the matter from the patient's head that can potentially cause a problem. Anything that's in the field of view when we acquire the PET data can cause a problem. That includes the, the head claws we use on the MR. It includes anything else like pillows or ear defenders that we might put, in, put, put within the scanner. So it's important how we actually use these scanners ensuring that the, the corrections that the manufacturers implement on their systems are, 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 are working effectively. So to address these problems, um, we, were, we were fortunate to get some, some funding in a, in, a, in a partnership grant. This grant was led by uh, Professor Carl Herholtz and addressed a number of things from um, yeah, coordination, communication, training, governance, and regulatory support. And I led with uh, um, Professor Frederick Bar Barkov the, um, the, the, the task force on, on harmonization. And what we were trying to do there is, with this task force is to, to harmonize the protocols and optimize the protocols for clinical trials. We did quite a, work, quite a bit of work on scanner qualification with the 
the, um, the King's Group leading on that, but also um, developing, you know, phantoms, tests, to test the quality of the data that are more appropriate for, 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 for brain scans. But the problem with these sorts of tests, which are standard to do for, in a, for a clinical trial for PET-CT, is that with PET-MR we cheat. We basically tell the, the scanner what the attenuating properties of these phantoms are, and they're not therefore testing what we think is the weak um, point of PET-MR as to how well the attenuation correction works. So inevitably, at some point, you have to stick a, a, a patient in the scanner and test how well the, the, the attenuation works um, within patients. So for that reason, we set up a clinical trial. Um, we f the first thing we did was actually decide on what we want to do with these scanners. We create protocols that we harmonized across two scanners within the network, um, uh, G and Siemens uh, PET-MR scanners. And then once we'd harmonized those, those protocols, we then set about measuring the variability with a test-retest um, study design to look at repeatability, same measurements at the same site, um, and then re reproducibilities, having the participant travel to another site and seeing whether the, the, there are any differences in the measurements that, that, that we make. And we also had secondary objectives. Test-retest may depend on exactly how you process the, the data does that matter? Um, and also, and to keep the data as a repository that we can use for the, the assessment of any new uh, methods that might, that might be developed, and also to optimize our future clinical trials. So the study design was, it was um, prospective repeated measure design at these eight um, PET-MR scanning sites in the UK. In total, we ended up um, uh, aiming to um, uh, scan 45 healthy elderly participants at the two scans. Each site recruited up to six uh, participants, and those were randomized into one of three groups. Repeatability, scanned twice at the same site. What we refer to as intra-scanner reproducibility, scanned at um, a, a site, and then scanned at a different site, but with the same equipment. So if you had it scanned on a G scanner, you go and be scanned on a GE scanner at a, at a different site, and then inter-scanner reproducibility, where you had both a, a scan with a GE scanner and, and, and a Siemens scanner. Um, so just, just very briefly, some of the, the choices for the, the, the design. So test-retest is dependent on the radio tracer, and the reason for that is radio tracers can be um, dependent on, on, on a number of factors in terms of how sensitive they are to noise to the, to the end point that you're measuring, but also, you know, some radio tracers like FDG are sensitive to the, to the environment. And primarily what we want to test with our study was the difference between PET-MR and, and, and PET-CT. And the amyloid tracers have excellent test, test, retest. So we, we, we chose the amyloid tra um, uh, tracer to, to, to test whether we can get equally as good uh, test, re test, re test, retest results with with PET-MR. We spent a lot of time debating whether we wanted to do a complex, what's referred to, often referred to as a coffee break design, or a static. We, in the end, we kept it simple, going for a static. I'm glad we did with all the other challenges that we, we ended, up, uh, ended up having with this study. We didn't want to compromise the MR data, so we wanted the best quality coils that were available on these, these two imaging systems. Um, so we, um, we had to do some work to make sure that we, um, we, we, we basically did some of the, the setup needed to be done to ensure quantitation was, 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 was carried out. And then we put together a set of, of sequences. We worked across the DPUK. These are the same sequences that were, um, for, or the MR sequences were the same sequences that were designed for the deep and frequent phenotype and, uh, st study to basically create these harmonized uh, protocols for these, for these two scanners. Data management was a very important part of the study. We used REDCap for the, uh, the, the, the case report forms. Um, and for the imaging data, we made use of the, of the DPUK imaging informatics solution, which I think now is referred to as the Im imaging uh, hub, um, where we, um, we pipe both the image data, but also the raw PET data and the raw MR data to, to this repository. 
The analysis was, was led by um, 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 UCL, by, by Pavel Markovich, where a pipeline was de developed to calculate uh, centeloid values, and we also had some uh, um, clinical reading, uh, which was done at Edinburgh and UCL. We had lots of challenges. I won't dwell on these, um, but the radio tracer provision kept changing throughout the study. We started with, we, we planned initially to use fluor beta peer, but then it was withdrawn from Europe. We ended up starting with flutamethamol, but then there was COVID, and when we started again, that wasn't available everywhere in the UK, so we ended up with a mixed tracer design of using flutamethamol and, and, and fluor beta ben. And then, of course, there was COVID-19, which caused a fairly significant break in, in the study. We'd only just started in January 2020 when COVID happened, and we, did, we weren't able to restart until April 2021. The um, results, well, after all the challenges, it was what we thought was quite successful. We managed to, um, all the sites managed to, to recruit at least half of the planned participants. The scans were extremely well tolerated with remarkably few um, poor quality data sets. Um, in fact, we don't, I think there was what the, the scanner, one scan, the PET system stopped acquiring data on the, and we lost a bit of the raw PET data on at one site. Apart from that, we've got pretty much complete data for all, all the scans we conducted. In total, we completed 77 of the planned 90 uh, PET MR scans with 37 of the planned 45 participants getting both the test and the retest uh, scans. And then the, the, key, the key result is looking at the, the test retest of the, the centeloid values that are used to quantify the uptake of amyloid, and we saw excellent test retest um, uh, um, for these participants. And this wasn't notably different between the three groups, the repeatability, intrascanner, and interscanner reproducibility. It wasn't dependent on the scanner, wasn't dependent on the radio tracer. And this sort of test retest is more than adequate for uh, use as a response biomarker or as a predictive mark biomarker with, again, Jeff showed the, the slide where with the locanumab trial, you see a, a change in 60% in, in, in on average uh, decrease with, with that particular uh, intervention. There was, however, one of the 37 participants which wasn't quite as good. If you look on the on, on the graph there, you can see there was participant C1. And we went and further investigated what had happened. And when we, when we investigated that, that was indeed what we, one of the potential weaknesses of PETMA. It was due to um, issues with um, attenuation correction. We were able to examine that, both seeing uh, the, the artifact on the image and also looking at the, the map that's created, what's the mu map that's used for, um, for, for, for attenuation correction but that was only one out of the 37. And that was one particular method and uh, alternative methods for attenuation correction. If you go to the alternative method, you saw actually quite a good uh, test, test retest. So to, to conclude, so we've, we've, we've managed to develop um, imaging protocols for use uh, in, in dementia research and clinical trials. Um, we've got excellent test retest of centeloid values in the brain that is provides very similar to results that have been previously reported for PET-CT. But we can't completely d dismiss the issue of attenuation correction. It's good enough, but we need to be careful how we use these systems, and we need to put in place appropriate quality assurance measures, both to ensure the accuracy of the, of the, of the attenuation correction methods we're using, but also on an individual basis to do some quality assurance to ensure that for that individual the, the algorithms are, are working, such as looking at these um, uh, c correction maps. We, we, we plan to do more analysis of the, of, of the data, so it, it, to look at things like the test retest of clinical reads, to look at the test retest of the various MR uh, measurements that we've also made, and to look at um, the various different ways that we can process the data to see whether methodological options can change the, 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 the test retest. But the bottom line is that we believe that the network is ready to perform uh, multi-center studies to a level, to a similar level of accuracy to that of PET-CT. And then the final thing, I just, just want to flag some of the, 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 the things that we've, we've achieved and some of the challenges. So 
the first thing is that the training is really important on these, on the, on these scanners. Radiographers get trained, trained and specialized either for nuclear medicine PET imaging or MR imaging, and there needs to be appropriate cross-training to use these scanners uh, uh, appropriately. And that's one, one thing that I haven't dwelled on that we've, we've, been we've also addressed. Multi-center studies are not easy to do and require significant you know, organization structures and governance with lots of challenges that we've had to address, like you know, defining how to use PET-MR scanners, writing a guidebook, together with the electronic protocols that get physically uploaded to, to these scanners, addressing the numerous regulatory and contractual issues of actually setting up these studies, addressing things like site, site qualification, data management, analysis pipelines. And in addressing these, these problems, the solutions that we've, that we've put together should hopefully benefit future uh, multi-center studies. And then the final thing is that this is only possible by a, a, a genuine collaborative relationship across these eight sites. Yeah, together we've, we've, you know, we've partitioned the, the, the numerous challenges b between the sites and jointly we face these challenges to be able to deliver this, this study. And I can, would like to thank the many the many, many people that have been involved in this study. So thank you. Um, do you expect that these, uh, these results that you've had for amyloid will translate into tau PET? Um? Okay, so that's, that's, that's a really good question. So the, the primary difference between PET-CT and, 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 and PET-MR is around attenuation correction, and, and that's going to be the same for wh whether you give a tau tracer or, 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 or an amyloid uh, tra tracer. But that, it might, might be the case that the, the way that you analyze the image to go from the image to the endpoint, that might be slightly different in its sensitivity to how you'd analyze a, a tau tracer to, to, to an amyloid tracer. But we, we have the data for which we can actually understand that because we've kept the mu maps, we've kept all the, 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 the details where we could, we, could e we could predict what you'd expect to see. So, uh, so, so although you can make arguments that there, that there would be differences, I think we're in a good position to be able to predict what those differences would be, to make an assessment as, 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 as to whether, you know, whether there's any degradation in the quality of the data on a PET-MR system to a PET-CT system. I suspect not based on this, on this data. Oh, uh, hi, Julian. It's Paul Edison from Imperial. Uh, can I just check one thing? You know, since you are actually normalizing the data to the cerebellum, yeah. Um, does it make a huge difference between the scanners? And indeed, did you check whether if you were to use a patient with RTL sampling, would that data hold the same truth? So we, did, we didn't collect blood data to, 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 to do, have, have that as a, as a comparator. As you say, it was a, um, 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 you know, it, it was a, a, you know, using the cerebellum as, as, as a reference tissue. We didn't see differences between the scanners, if that was your, 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 your question. We saw you know, the same um, values on a Siemens system to a GE system. So uh, there's consistency, but it doesn't mean necessarily that you get the same as you, if you were doing, using blood as a reference. Yeah, okay, thank but you. That, but that's, that, that comes down, that's more, rather than PET-MR versus PET-CT, that's more you know, centeloids as a way of quantifying the data versus kinetic modeling way of um, of quantifying the, 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 the data. Thank you. And any other questions? I guess not. Okay, no more questions. Thank 